Good evening and welcome to Fiber in Hong Kong. I'm Erica. Have you ever stopped to think about how everything around us is made? The clothes we wear, the cars we drive, and the gadgets we use every day. It's truly amazing to see how far we've come as a society thanks to industrialization, which has shaped the world we live in today. Our city has always been a hub for INT, and we're seeing new forms of industrialization emerge that are driven by innovation and technology. Tonight, we'll be talking about the recent new industrialization wave, where creativity meets new technologies. Before we get to that, let's take a look at some of the supportive measures and policies the government has rolled out to prepare Hong Kong for this new phase of industrialization. Hong Kong is a free and dynamic society where creativity and entrepreneurship converge. It's a vibrant city with a stellar reputation for its design, research and development, innovation and technology. So now, let me tell you more about its innovation and development. In the 2023 to 2024 budget, the government announced that it will promote advanced manufacturing activities and has encouraged private enterprises to invest more resources in R&D work to support Hong Kong in developing into an international innovation and technology hub. Officials, industry members, as well as representatives from academia and the research sector gather to share their insights about Hong Kong's strengths and the opportunities of new industrialization. With me today is Professor San, Hong Kong Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry. Hello, Professor San. Hello, Michelle. How will you describe the quality and standard of Hong Kong homegrown innovation and its global competitiveness? Hong Kong has a strong research capability and enjoy clear advantages mm. in fundamental research. Uh, many of our scholars are international leading mm. scientists. So five universities in Hong Kong have been ranked in top 100, and two medical schools have been ranked in top 40. Our clinical data can be internationally recognized for medical registration, which will make Hong Kong become ideal place for biotech development. The Hong Kong government is now advocating new industrialization. So what do you think that makes Hong Kong stand out? Like, what is the strength in this area? Hong Kong is the most international city in China with a robust rule of law and intellectual property rights protection system. Hong Kong can relatively easily put together innovation resources among the GPA and the globe, complement the country's due circulation development pattern. We have a pretty strong research capabilities and originality with subversive research outcome as well as the ability to break through from zero to one. So how is Hong Kong doing in terms of attracting new talents and international investment to fuel new industrialization? We recently launched the Top Talent Pass game, which has been run successfully over the past several months. So we will provide uh, special measures facilitation measures to attract the top talent in a target manner. We currently plan to build a second inner cell near the Hong Kong Science Park. We also plan to provide more accommodation space for anti talents. The existing technology talent admission scheme has been strengthened and its coverage was expanded to more uh, emerging technology areas. The subsidies provided by the research institutes and the INT enterprises. Our goal is to attract uh, more than 100 high potential or high representative enterprises to set up or expand their business in Hong Kong, uh, where uh, at least 20 of them will be top-notch enterprises. <laughs> With Hong Kong's outstanding R&D capabilities and the advantages of internationalization and marketization, the innovations in new industrialization are providing fresh impetus for economic growth and creating quality employment opportunities for young people. It's very encouraging to see local inventions being recognized worldwide. 
Well, joining us here today at the studio is Dr. Sunny Chai. Dr. Chai is the chairman of the Federation of Hong Kong Industries and the chairman of Hong Kong Science and Technology Parts. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chai, for sharing your insights with us about INT development and new industrialization in Hong Kong. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Nice to meet you, Misa. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Well, Dr. Chai, we know that the 1970s and 80s were the golden age of industrialization in Hong Kong. Do you think that is still the viable area for development um, in this current day and age so we go we have to go back 50 years ago right so uh, the definition was different and then in the 70s we we'll, uh, Hong Kong industrialists were re relying on OEMs so meaning uh, global branded companies uh, they would try to uh, source for a lower cost or relocating their factories into Hong Kong so Hong Kong was a great place and with enough uh, a labor force to, to, to sustain that. And so in the 80s and 90s, a lot of our industrialists also learn from their customers from OEM and turn into ODM or even OBMs. So they have moved some of their production facilities into uh, China or somewhere in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And so when you get into the, the after uh, the 2000, uh, with the uh, increase, increasing of our labor uh, costs, all that, uh, companies must look for new ways for reindustrialization, or we call new in industrialization today. Right. Would you say those are the specific challenges that the local indus industrial sector is facing currently? Okay. Uh, according to the uh, INT blueprint uh, released in December last year, there were some uh, targets that uh, we want to uh, hit in the next uh, few years. For example, uh, manufacturing GDP, uh, we want to achieve 1.5% uh, by year 2027, or 5% uh, within a decade. So the challenges will be, number one, uh, we have limited land resources. Right. Okay. Second, uh, do we have enough companies to land their footprint uh, to to preserve as a manufacturer in Hong Kong. Third, do we have enough skilled laborers? Okay, and uh, I mentioned about land. Land is the major lim limitation because, uh, according to land, uh, industrial land. I mean, uh, there are some available in uh, uh, you know parks in in Taipo, Yunnan, or, or, or TKO. Right. And of course, in the next uh, decade, hopefully. We're looking for more INT or industrial land in the northern uh, metropolis or Suntan uh, Tunnel Port. But that won't come within, within five or seven years. So the challenge is whether we want to achieve uh, the, the manufacturing GDP target or we want, also want to take care of some traditional industry. So we have to draw a balance in between. Right, so it's not a problem of only, you know, taking care of one element, but uh, a balance of both. Yeah. Um, going forward, it's clear that INT will play a crucial role in new industrialization. How do they complement each other? If you ask me this question 10 years ago, right. uh, I would say most of the industrialists will still focus on whatever products they could hit the market, but less uh, research and development process okay but today if we look at uh, the new companies that came out and joined the Inno parks for example the advanced manufacturing center uh, seven out of ten tech companies that entered into these centers are what we call new tech new industry for example in in, uh, in a center we call Mars uh, medical uh, uh, surprise uh, 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 manufacturing center. Uh, we have company producing uh, MRI machines. Mm -hmm. We have company doing 3D printing of bones for operations. So these are re really high added value companies that uh, complement our, our new in industrialization. Right. Yeah. So it, it sounds like Hong Kong is standing in a 
quite important role in, in the worldwide technology scene. Well, human resources is another major issue in Hong Kong. Uh, how can we recruit talents to fuel new industrialization? And does Hong Kong have enough appeal for these overseas talents? Uh, I think uh, in this term of government, uh, they have uh, pro uh, proactive reacted very well uh, by uh, pushing out the tech talent uh, scheme and also the tech uh, talent pass scheme. And, and also in the university, I think in the coming days, we hope to see uh, expanding uh, the 20% uh, cap on uh, receiving uh, foreign students, including mainland students. And uh, of course, on the uh, industrialization side, besides uh, uh, research or R and D students, uh, uh, we do we do we need students not just having a PhD degree, but but on the technical level. So we should look into uh, recruiting students graduating from technical college as well. Right. Yeah. So um, we do need to draw more students, you know, graduates from educational institutions, uh, both locally and worldwide. So at this current day and age, um, are overseas uh, investors and institutions willing to invest in Hong Kong's industrial sector? Do you think so? Um, okay. So let's put the COVID periods aside. Well, we are back to normal. I, I'm very, really, really confident because if you look at uh, the fundraising uh, uh, results at Science Park, uh, if I look back five years ago uh, to today, uh, account for last year actually, uh, the fund raised in Science Park was uh, over 80 billion. Wow. Yeah, 80 billion. Impressive. Hong Kong. Yeah, impressive. And it was like, like five times more than, than three years ago. And at Science Park, we also have our corporate venture uh, uh, fund. When we put in one dollar, it brings nineteen dollars from uh, external ventures. That's a great return yeah. there. Yeah. Well, well, that's. It sounds like a very effective policy um, that the government has right there. Well, I understand that you've recently been appointed as a member of the Chief Executive Council of Advisors. So, what advice do you have for the government um, in terms of current policies? Actually, uh, we will, I mean, I, for myself, I mean, any ideas, <clears throat> any opinion that will facilitate to speed up Hong Kong as an international INT hub, we will do it. Right. Yeah. So do you think the current policies are pushing for rapid development, you know, in the related industrial sectors? Definitely, definitely. Because uh, if I, I've been doing this for 35 years, but if you look at the last seven, eight years, uh, including this term of government, last term and the previous term, the amount of INT investment from the government is tremendous. I always call this a, a golden age to do INT. Right. Well, finally, what message do you have for um, you know potential investors regarding industrial development in Hong Kong? And okay, if we go back to uh, uh, last year, President Xi Jinping visited Hong Kong. And he visited the science park, so it's a, it's a, I mean, very definite sign that Hong Kong role as an international INT hub is very important. And also, uh, in the recent uh, CPPCC meeting, uh, it's very clear that we have to speed up the role of Hong Kong to be an international INT hub. So, for investor, for tech startups, for our researchers, uh, our golden age will last. Right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chai, for sharing your insights with us tonight. From the conversation with Dr. Chai just now, we learned that Hong Kong is a thriving INT hub with a supportive environment that plays a significant role in the global innovation arena. But that's not all. Hong Kong is also a center for arts and cultural innovation, with its arts community offering exciting opportunities for business investors. And the best part? The market has become more accessible than ever, with entry-level options starting from as low as $1,000. Let's take a closer look at some of the Hong Kong dynamic art scene. And remember to join us for part two, as we'll be taking you on a trip to Tai O and having a chat with a sake specialist. <laughs> Art has had a long history in human civilization. Apart from being a way to express one's personality, collecting art is also a means of investment. 
and artwork can be worth a fortune. At a series of auctions in Hong Kong in April, four lots went under the hammer for more than 100 million Hong Kong dollars each. From this, it seems that art is an investment option that has the potential for high returns. But how can ordinary people like you and me become art collectors when we don't have the luxury of spending millions? Well, affordable art might just hold the answer. Let's learn more about what it is. Hi Regina, so what is affordable art and how did the concept of affordable art come about? So affordable art fair is a contemporary art fair that takes place annually in Hong Kong. We want to make this a very joyful journey um, that everyone would be able to find something that they love. Um, art can be something very simple and very straightforward when you see something you like aimed at making art accessible to a broader audience. Affordable Art Fair Hong Kong was held at the Convention and Exhibition Center last month. High quality contemporary artworks priced between 1,000 and 100,000 Hong Kong dollars were exhibited by more than 90 galleries. Affordable Art Fair is an international event taking place in cities across the world, including London, Amsterdam, Brussels, New York, and Singapore. It was first launched in Hong Kong 10 years ago. The range of affordable art is quite large. Um, a lot of galleries and artists have the opportunity to sell their artworks. Um, this provides them a platform to continue in their career, to expand their career or expand to um, other cities internationally as well. Local designer and artist Rick Lowe is this year's featured artist. His work, Good Old Kai Tuck, was used as the fair's campaign image. On a mission to record everything before they disappear, Rick creates pieces that bring back some of Hong Kong people's childhood memories. Hi, Rick. Hello. <laughs> so why did you choose Kai Tuck as the inspiration for your artwork? Uh, well, I love playing. I love uh, flying. Kai Tuck is part of the memories of Hong Kong people. We, we are the generation that witnessing uh, the airport moved from Kai Tak to, to Chet Lapcock nowadays. When the plane land to the Kai Tak airport, it almost landing on the rooftop of the building. We have a very rich resource uh, that we can pick from all those visuals around uh, in Hong Kong, such as on the streets, on the buildings, and also uh, the neon night signage, especially the tram, Slough Ferry. Those are very unique things that you can find in Hong Kong. I think those are very interesting things. With the relaxing of COVID measures, more artists and gallery operators from around the world were able to participate in this international event in Hong Kong this year. We've had some amazing uh, sales, and so people have been responding very well, and we've had an interesting mix of nationalities buying our work, uh, both local residents and also uh, expatriates, French, Italian, English, German, so a real cross-section. It's actually my first time in Hong Kong. There's such a cool mix of cultures here and fashion and it's very cosmopolitan and so I felt it went really well with the art that I do. Simone Vargas is a Colombian multidisciplinary artist who is currently based in the U.S. He and his partner operate a gallery which focuses on the promotion of Latin American artists. Latin American people have beautiful art. It's full of color, life, texture, uh, and so I really wanted to bring it to places like Hong Kong. One of the major uh, good things that I've seen here is that there are so many international people. That is something that I, only Hong Kong could offer because uh, we don't get that in a lot of fairs, such, uh, such a breadth of international people. Local galleries which represent a renowned group of artists and deal mainly in premium artworks were also present at the fair. Affordable. 
，有咁多畫廊，有咁多作品，好開心嘅一樣嘢咧，就睇到誒、呃、藝術作品可以咁普及喺香港。The 10th edition of Affordable Art Fair Hong Kong featured 270 new artists who had never taken part in the event before. I think Affordable Art Fair is quite a very good starting point for all the artists because like everyone can participate in. Uh, all the artists have their work and display their work and show to the public as well. As regards the galleries that have come from all over the world, so in a way it's just seeing different global influences and I think of course Hong Kong is profoundly global and its significance uh, as a, a global hub uh, here in the uh, in the Far East so at every level both from the size of the potential population um, as well as uh, the the interest in our artwork we're very happy to keep coming here The response is really overwhelming. Um, we were expecting um, about this amount of audience, um, but I think it's even more than what we expected, visitor-wise and also art sales. So we aim to really continue this fair as we see that there is a big demand in Hong Kong. So, having visited this fair today, I now understand that we don't have to be millionaires to collect art. Anyone can be a master art collector by starting small with affordable pieces. And where better to begin your art collecting journey than Asia's art hub, Hong Kong. Welcome back to Vibrant Hong Kong. Well, Erica, the pandemic is finally over. It's really great to see all these crowds flocking back to our city. It's a cause for celebration indeed. With quarantine restrictions lifted, tourists can now experience Hong Kong to their heart's content. All of our attractions are waiting for you. That's true. And one of the po most popular tourist spots for both foreigners and the residents of urban Hong Kong is Tai O. Surrounded by mountains and the sea, this fishing village shows off the natural, serene side to our city. That's right. Visitors also have the option of staying at Tai O Heritage Hotel. We'll now hand over to Denise to talk more about this historic site. <laughs> Fishing Village on Lantau Island is renowned for its traditional stilt house community and seafood. Time will appear to stand still as you explore its narrow alleys and fish markets. This place is often referred to as the Venice of the Orient. If you take a stroll through Tai O, you'll come across a remarkable building, the Tai O Heritage Hotel. Tranquilly nestled in the westernmost strip of Hong Kong, Taiyo Heritage Hotel was converted from the old Taiyo Marine Police Station built in 1902 by the colonial government. With its mid-hill location offering views of the seascape to the south and the west, it proved to be an ideal strategic site in the fight against pirates prevalent in the neighboring waters. The searchlight, mounted on a concrete base, is located on a hill in front of and overlooking Tai O Pier. The combination of watchtowers and searchlights played a crucial role in the history and development of defense in Hong Kong. First thing that strikes you about this building are those characteristic arches, those elliptical arches. Now, that feature is actually what we call the veranda. That already tells you something about this building, that it is a product of colonialism in a way where you know, the British found that this local feature of the veranda was actually quite useful in cutting down the heat. The tiles which are used on the roof are Chinese, so the classic double pan and row tiles. And this is characteristic of most traditional Chinese architecture in southern China. And the reason for having the two layers is because to insulate the interior from heat as well. Fast 
for it a century. The restoration of the site came about in 2009. This nine-room boutique hotel has preserved the unique features of the old police station. Let's go inside. This room in the main block is a visitor center at Exhibition Hall. It was converted from the old police charge room. See, there used to be two cells in this report room. The revitalization of Old Tayo Police Station is one of six projects under Batch 1 of the Development Bureau's Revitalizing Historic Buildings through Partnership Scheme. The Antiquities Advisory Board has rated it as a Grade 2 historic building. There are nine colonial-style rooms and suites, all of which were renovated from officers' rooms, the armory and the lounge. They're named after the Hong Kong Marine Police Force ranks and vessels. The sea lion, the sea tiger, these are actual marine vessels that used to be stationed at the Thai Old Police. And that's why we actually conserve these names as well. When you first enter into the room, the first thing um, you have caught the attention is actually the fireplace. So the fireplace also has a story because um, Thai Old being so rural as well, in the winter time it's like actually quite cold. So that's why in the olden days they do have a fireplace for the officers. If we look into our windows, you can also see that we took a lot of efforts to preserve its traditionals as well, such as the French shutters, the lock itself. I hear that is the stories behind the pond, so can you tell us more about it? Well, this pond is actually a replica from the original build in 1967. And this is actually built by one of the former police officers by disciplinary action. And as you know that Thai Old Police Station is a rural area. And in the olden days, as told by the Thai Old Police officers, actually for them, it took them more than three to five hours back to town, meaning that they have to spend their days and week in this police station. So it's very important for them to actually make good use of the time. That's why the police officers actually build the pond here, so that they can actually look into the beautiful flowers, they can also catch fishes as well. If you want to treat your loved ones to a special meal, the glass-roofed restaurant situated on the first floor of the hotel is the perfect place. So when we actually look at this new addition, the intervention can easily be reversed. So one day, if this building is no longer being used as a hotel, you can easily demolish this new addition. This is actually an example of good heritage conservation. More and more historical buildings are being revitalized into hotels. This trend encourages further sustainable initiatives in Hong Kong. It's definitely a trend because, again, you know, the buzzword nowadays is cultural tourism. There is actually a, an appeal there. And then it is important you know, for the government to actually capitalize on this, so to develop a very robust cultural tourism policy. Heritage Hotel's tranquil environment is perfect for sitting down to enjoy a slice of cake. Well, add fine wine and good company to the mix and you're sure to forget all your worries. On the subject of wine, I'm finding that Hong Kongers' preferences and choices have diversified. Apart from beer and red wine, Japanese sake has also become very popular among both locals and tourists in recent years. I get what you mean as we're seeing sake bars pop up all over Hong Kong now. According to a report by Japan's Ministry of Finance, about 76 million U.S. dollars worth of sake was exported to our city in 2021, making Hong Kong the third biggest importer of sake in the world. That's why we've invited sake specialist Ken Chan to talk more about the sake culture and the current situation of global sake market. Hello, Ken. Hello, Hi, Alan. Ken. Thank you for joining us on Vibrant Hong Kong. Well, sake is gaining popularity in Hong Kong. What's the case in Japan? Actually, every day Japanese drinks uh, Japanese sake. And actually, uh, for uh, Japanese people, we'll call 
uh, Japanese sake into uh, Nihonshu. Because uh, Nihonshu is their national drink, they drink every day. Uh, as you know, from the Hokkaido uh, to the Kyushu, they have so many uh, uh, breweries. I mean, the sake breweries is over a thousand uh, sake breweries in, in, in Japan. Uh, and the, as, because the uh, temperature is quite different from each other, and also the cultivation of rice and also the quality of the uh, water is quite different. So they are making their own local sake and drinking every day. It's about region and it's a daily beverage. Wow, I didn't know that temperature varies by region. Can I say that sake is only made in Japan exclusively? Not exactly. Actually, uh, for other countries, they uh, produce sake for their, their own countries. But actually, uh, for uh, Japan, they have uh, as I said, uh, Lihonshu is uh, this Japanese sake they have to make uh, and brew it in Japan because the uh, government organization is called Nation uh, Test Agency. Uh, they have the regulations to uh, lim limit uh, the breweries have to use the rice from Japan only and also the uh, water from Japan and also the breweries in Japan to make the brew the sake, then they, they, they can claim that the sake is called Nihonshu. Wow, okay, so you can only claim it to be sake um, depending on the origin of production, right? Yes, origin. yes, of course. Okay, what about ingredients? As we all know that sake is made from rice. Um, yes. What makes it different from Chinese rice wine? Actually, uh, sake is made from rice. Uh, the ingredients actually have three, uh, rice, uh, rice koji, and water. And then uh, the uh, alcoholic beverage, uh, alcohol, alcohol level must be less than 22. But for Chinese wine, wine is actually, uh, they are distilled ported. Uh, they have to distill them uh, two, twice or even three times to make the concentration much more, to make the, uh, uh, the flavor much stronger than sake. So it's really about whether there's distillation in the process of production, right? Because we know when we buy red wine, we have to pay attention to um, winery reputation and vintage, right? Um, what about sake? How is it categorized and rated? Sake divide into two main series. One is called uh, uh, Dreamer series, and the other one is Honjojo series. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. actually, uh, for Dreamer series, is actually use rice, rice cozy, and water. But the Honjojo series, they use the this, uh, 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 alcohol added to make the flavor much more stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, the note is much more aromatic, and the flavor is much stronger. So they divide into two. And then uh, they use the rice production ratio, because you think that the rice, uh, and then they need to uh, mill the rice, and then the rice will be become uh, less and less, smaller and smaller, to distinguish the uh, classify the grading of the sake. Ken, let's talk about how we taste sake. I will say that uh, they will have function. For example, the lighter flavor, ar more aromatic sake, I will pair with uh, sushi, uh, sashimi, and some appetizer. But for my, well, some, some kinds of uh, dream my sake is much more rice flavor, then I will use them to pair with uh, uh, fried food or some kinds of uh, uh, steamed or fried uh, foods is better for, for the pairing. Wow. Thank you for sharing about the pairing with the sake. But, you know, let's, let's come to the logical questions. Should we drink it like hot or cold? What's the preference? Actually, in sake, we have when you see a sake is called ginjo, that means very aromatic. And uh, if we uh, uh, make it hot, then the, the aromatic will go out. So if you see some sake with uh, ginjo, then mm -hmm. you just uh, drink it cold, uh, and chill, uh, serve it chilled. And for all of the sake, is actually you can just uh, make it hot or make it uh, chilled because uh, sake is the, in the world, is actually uh, the serving temperature is the most widest. It's from five, temp uh, five degrees Celsius to 50 uh, degrees Celsius. Then different, different uh, temperature, then the, um, the aspect of the sake will change. Oh. That is very interesting for, for, the, for the food pairing and, 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 and self-enjoyment. Sake is gaining popularity in Hong Kong. Um, are there special reasons behind this, in your opinion? I think, as you know, uh, Hong Kongese very uh, love uh, Japanese culture, and they love 
traveling to, to Japan very, very much. And in Hong Kong also you can see some so many different kinds of Japanese restaurants. So uh, of course, you know, uh, more and more people love to uh, have, have to pairing to have a uh, good, good alcohol and also good foods. So the people will, uh, will have, uh, uh, because sake is very good to pair with food, uh, uh, sake is better than uh, using wine, because wine, when you use the wine uh, pairing, wine have so many limitations on the food pairing. But for not, not for sake, sake is very good to, uh, to pair with uh, not only Japanese cuisine, but also Chinese Western foods only. Too. That sounds like we still have so much to learn. Thank you so much for sharing. A big thank you to Ken for teaching us about sake culture today. In addition to being enjoyable on its own, wine can also enhance the flavor of different foods when paired correctly, taking the dining experience to the next level. And the best part is, there are so many different types of wines to choose from, each with its own characteristics and flavor profile. We can really create the perfect match by tailoring the wine to what we're eating. Now, which wine would you pair with the dish we're about to feature next? Let's take a look together. This, in Cantonese, is called a clay pot. And if we cook rice in this clay pot, we call it clay pot rice. It's the ultimate comfort food during the winter time in Hong Kong as it really warms our tummy. But really, we can eat it all year round. So today, I've invited Mohit from Nepal to come and try clay pot rice with me. In front of us is the clay pot rice, and it's basically a one-pot meal because the rice is on the bottom and then the toppings are on the top. Now, Mohit, I know that rice is a staple in Nepal. Do you have anything similar to this back home? Mm, I don't think so. When we eat rice, we usually just boil it and then eat it. So the, all of this is quite new to me. We'll be trying the preserved meats first as the topping is really flavorful. So all of that aroma and fragrance will seep into the rice. Have you had preserved meats before? I think in Nepal, we uh, eat uh, dried buffalo meat as a snack and it goes really good with alcohol, but I wouldn't eat that with rice. So this is a very new experience for me. Lap is a Chinese method of marinating meat with salt or other sauces and then air dried. Some common ones are lap cheng, preserved sausage, lap yok, preserved pork belly, and yun cheng, liver sausage, which is either goose or duck liver. Okay, without further ado, let's eat it while it's hot. Yeah. Whoa! So before serving, we usually like to mix everything through to incorporate all the flavors together. Mmm. Mm. So good, right? Mm. I like how chewy it is. I'm surprised. Uh, although it's just plain rice, it's still so good. I could have this every day. Mohit, do you know what the best part about clay pot rice is? Well, what is it? It's actually hidden at the bottom of the pot. Uh -huh. <gasps> wow. Whoa! It's the fan siu, which is also called crispy rice mm -hmm. or scorched rice. Mm. So satisfying, the sound. Mm. It's like so crunchy, right? Yeah. Do you have something similar to crunchy rice back home? No, I don't think so. The closest thing that I can think of to crunchy rice is sometimes you overcook the rice or you add too less water and the rice gets kind of burned. So besides that, like nothing similar to crunchy rice. If you're interested, you can actually make a clay pot rice at home. All you really need is a clay pot. So why don't we go into the kitchen and see how a clay pot rice is made? First thing we're going to do is coat the bottom with lard to prevent the rice from sticking. Next, we're going to add in the rice and the water. Then we're going to bring the whole pot onto the stove and we're going to boil it on high heat for three to four minutes or until the water gets absorbed. Once that rice is prepared, now it's time for the toppings. You can put the toppings on top and we're going to cover the lid and just cook it for one more minute. At this point, 
take the pot gets transferred over to the grill and this is the final stage. It gets cooked for another 10 minutes and this is where all the flavors will fuse together and become friends. For us, let's go out and wait. Yeah, let's go. We'll see you later. Popular clay pot rice toppings are preserved meat, spare ribs, chicken, white eel, frog, and so on. The traditional way of making clay pot rice uses charcoal, but nowadays, due to convenience, most restaurants use gas stoves. Of course, though rare, there are still some restaurants that continue on the traditional method of using charcoal. So Mohit, I know that you've never tried white eel before, but I feel like today is as good of a time as any. Some people say that soy sauce is a must when it comes to clay pot rice. Mm. Did you want to give it a try? Ah, I'd love to, I'd love to. Ooh. Whoa! Woohoo! Woo, woo. Okay. So we have to wait for about a minute, but as we're doing that, let me explain to you about the soy sauce. Mm -hmm. The soy sauce is customized, so every chef will have their own secret recipe, oh. but it's usually on the sweet side because that sweet soy sauce will enhance the savoriness of the dish. You ready? Yeah. <sighs> so good. I know. Let's do it. So what did you think about the white eel? so good like once i started eating it i can't stop it's that good and between the white eel clay pot rice and the preserved meat clay pot rice which one did you prefer mm, if you want me to be honest i would say i prefer the preserved meat clay pot rice but don't get me wrong this one is still pretty good this was your first clay pot rice experience yeah, how did yeah. you find it yeah i'm pretty good as i already said i really enjoyed both of the dishes and learned a lot about them and i really appreciate that during the winter time, if I feel a little gloomy, I know where to go, you know, to find my comfort food. Thanks so much for being here with me, and we'll see you in the next one. Tonight, we've explored some of the most exciting innovations that are driving Hong Kong forward into a new era of industrialization, all within a supportive environment that encourages growth and development. We also caught a glimpse of one of Hong Kong's most beautiful scenic spots, Tai O, and learned about sake culture. All these elements come together to make Hong Kong one of the most appealing and vibrant cities in the world. Thank you for watching tonight, and please join us next time for more insights into this amazing city. Before we go, here's a little suggestion on where to have some fun in the sun over the next few weeks. Summer, the season of sunny skies and good vibes. It's the perfect time to relax and have some fun together. So, what do families and kids do during this lovely season? Let's find out. I got to do a lot of summer homework in summer. I'm going to Australia and I really want to go to the beach with my cousins. Maybe find seashells and then build a sandcastle. You can actually make and, and make edible ice cream. I, ice cream is edible. Yeah, I know. If you're looking for a chill summer vibe, the annual summer fest at the Central Harbour Front event space may be a good option. This year's theme is Fun in the Sun, and it offers a variety of anchor outdoor activities and special exciting programs. So let's get ready for an unforgettable summer festival experience. Ready to bounce sunny side up? Let's boing our hearts out together. <laughs> Young and brave racers, gear up and show the world what you're made of at the little driver's racing track. Wanna make a splash on this giant blue whale? Let's give it a whale of a time. Attention all photo lovers, sunflowers and retro buses are waiting for your close-up.
strike a pose, snap some shots, and let your creativity bloom. Running from today until July 23rd, there will be more special weekend activities. And the best part? Admission is free. So mark your calendars, gather your friends and family to enjoy this summer fest.